What we thought we'd do today is something different than a normal field day. Uh, these are the ones I participated in instead of just preaching at you and lecturing technology. We thought we'd actually have a conversation more at a higher level about what's going on in the industry and then how are customers, uh, and a very unique customer at that case, actually doing cloud networking on-prem. And uh, so the conversation, I'm going to help introduce the concept of this thing to make it easier for Don to jump into how he's doing things. And Don is with BNSF. He's going to talk about how train systems work in the United States in a way that's probably going to surprise a lot of people. Uh, I'd say they're one of the most innovative companies I've seen in a long time. And that's not only my opinion, and they've actually won awards for being so innovative and being a great place to work in the United States. So with that, let me jump in real quick into some of the conversations and talks we had. And uh, we just ran across the uh, Vegas to join you here. And nothing is close in Vegas, so we're all a little out of breath. So forgive us for that. Uh, so start off real quick. This is Dell Tech World. And we made a really interesting announcement this week. So it's been a big week for us and Dell. We actually announced OEM. We're the only open networking company on Dell's OEM product line. So it makes it very easy for customers to be able to have a one source to actually be able to build their own cloud like Amazon on-prem. And that, uh, that's going to enable a lot of interesting things and to include be able to do exactly everything that Don's going to talk about in your own environments. So I want to start with more of a uh, gorilla in a room that most people aren't talking about. And it relates back to a concept called shadow IT. There's many other ways you can kind of relate around that. And it's more of a general concept of respect to the way we look at things at Big Switch. So it's a general idea that applications have an affinity to be in a certain place. For example, no one should ever write a CRM system ever again. Just buy something from Salesforce. No one should write their own expense system ever again. There are already tools for that exist. And that's an interesting kind of flavor as you think about how all technology evolves over time. Things become commodity, and certain things become strategic. And that's an interesting place as we look at the flow as it goes across the cloud environment. And that cloud shouldn't be a location. And all too often, I think, in our industry, no matter whether we're talking compute, we're talking storage, we're talking networking, any IT team I talk to, whenever you see the word cloud, it immediately conjures up this idea of out there. And on-prem is something completely different. And that's not actually the way we should be thinking about things. We really should be thinking about things as cloud isn't a location. It should be about a set of principles and methods of designing a data center that actually makes it better to use so that the applications can naturally flow where they want to go. Because the reality is, is that networking hasn't evolved the way that compute and storage has. And networking in a lot of places has become this, uh, this anchor to applications so that they can't actually move where they need to in that evolution as we were talking about in the previous slide. And networks have held applications back. So if you're building your existing data center with these phenomenal compute and storage environments and virtual capabilities that can quickly spin up VMs and containers and move them everywhere, but your network still needs to be manually provisioned hop by hop or has series and series of policy servers pretending to be SDN controllers, then it's going to actually slow down the ability to deploy applications on top of that. In environments that you see actually that do cloud, like the ones we were talking about on a previous slide, Google, Amazon, Microsoft, Facebook, PayPal, they don't take a campus network solution from a vendor that has slapped a data center title on top of it with a bunch of complex software and then say it's cloud ready. Those environments, in order to build out to the scale that they did, they had to start with a fresh sheet of paper. They're not using VRFs and VLANs the way that everybody else is doing it. They do something called a VPC, and that's a really critical thing. It is probably, from my own background, if those of you who don't know me, I actually have a previous voting member of the IEEE, 802.1. I have been a member of the IETF for 20 years. I was there in actually my previous tech field days. I was talking about the original fabric wars. I helped coin the term fabric in original generation. And Stephen asked me just a second ago, uh, how do I feel Big Switch is compared to what we were doing 10 years ago? And it's, to me, this is the natural evolution. That was generation one of fabrics, and it's doing phenomenal in campuses. But the real problem now is moving us into cloud data centers. On-prem needs to be built exactly the same way as the service providers. And this is Fabric 2.0. This is the next generation where we take things, where the network becomes invisible. Nobody should have to provision VLANs. No one should have to worry about what's going on in the infrastructure. You should just spin up whatever it is you're doing in your virtual environments. Four VMs, 4,000 VMs, five containers, 500 containers. And whatever is needed, connectivity between that compute 
that virtual environment and storage should automatically be turned on inside networking the same way Amazon makes the network invisible. But Amazon also did something else interesting with that VPC, is they made the network completely invisible, and then they created this new concept of segmentation, where the VPC becomes a mini data center. And every app team in a given enterprise can use each VPC as if they was built privately just for them. Now, this works really, really well when you run it underneath VMware, ESX, NSX, really well when you're running on top of Nutanix. Because then the person who's configuring VMware or configuring Nutanix or whatever it is doesn't have to know a network is there. It just simply plugs in and the controller that's running the network automatically detects the VMs and containers. In fact, we recently did a lab move where we gave an intern the responsibility to move one of the pods over. This is a kid coming out fresh out of college, has really no idea about networking, compute, or storage. And we had to move from one co-location to another across town in California, Santa Clara. And he did it in half a day because he didn't need a network map. Moving company, rack and stack, powered everything, and all he had to do is simply just start plugging in the spine and the leaves and then the actual servers and compute into the switches and the controller automatically detected what that was and automatically configured the port. So he didn't need to know what switch was server one plugged to any other building, so that had to go into switch five, port 13. No, it didn't matter which port he plugged into that entire pod it would automatically detect it and automatically configure that port. So now you have an intern being able to deploy this. That allows technicians to be far more efficient so the engineers can actually do more strategic projects. Now, that's a pretty important thing because the technology that we're driving into this capability can only be done in one other place. That's in the hyperscalers, the, the service providers, but also into the Azure, the Google, the, uh, the Amazon. And the reason why we have the same pedigree as those carriers is we were born out of the same lab the Clean Slate Lab where SDN was born. And so we have that same pedigree of taking a new approach to networking, which means we also have the same VPC capability that you can do in Amazon, the same VNet capability you can do in Azure, as well as Google. So that allows a really interesting approach to the consistency in, a, in what you have as ability. The other interesting thing about this is, for me as a, uh, as a scientist and software person, APIs are not an afterthought in many many cases, right, for, for us that is. In many other cases and other vendors, APIs are something they add on after they build a feature. For us, everything revolves around the API, to include our CLI. When you're typing in commands about configuring a port, it's actually sending REST commands into the controller. The same REST command that the web GUI is, the same REST commands that vCenter is sending in, or Nutanix. It's the same REST command going to the same controller interface. Everything revolves around that because it's a true cloud solution. This running on-prem means that you can build exactly the same topology models in your data centers or your colos as you are up in Amazon, building a true hybrid, giving you a consistency of experience. So Paul, quick question yeah. around the enterprise cloud. This mm -hmm. term gets thrown a, a, around an awful lot. Yeah, it does. Uh, from when I think of cloud in this layer of abstraction they're just describing, ideally what I would like is a API to my data center and part of that API to my data centers, API to networking, and what I would like to be able to do is not care about the underlay as much. Mm -hmm. So specifically around virtualization and virtualized networks, whether it be NSX, Nutanix, or even uh, traditional open source Linux, mm -hmm. how, how how deep is that capability? Can I, you know, kind of set these things up? Can I have NSX running next to Nutanix, running yep. next to Linux, and then my the API that I give to my developers is a consistent API going through big switch? Is that like the vision? That is, it's not the vision, it's actually the reality. In fact, you actually just described Don's environment. So in almost all of our environments, we didn't put NSX, Nutanix, and Red Hat OpenShift and VMware up there for fun. In a lot of our environments, those are all running at the same time. We're agnostic to the hypervisor. Whether we're running Kubernetes, VMware NSX, and VMware ESX, and Nutanix in our environment, you can have VPCs per technology. You can have VPCs per app running on multiple of those hypervisor technologies. We just want to be the capability to automatically build out a true fabric connectivity based on what the application needs. So one of the challenges with that is that I get uneven capability between the three, between the, the, the platforms. 
NSX can do things that yeah. uh, Nutanix can't. Nutanix, I uh, would assume, can do things that NSX can't. And then you just have open source, which is you know you, probably the, the baseline. How do you present those capabilities or difference of capabilities via API to a developer? So there's two customers in this case you're describing there. There's the vAdmin who's trying to spin up resources quickly so that he can help an app team deploy an app real fast, right? And then there's the application developers and the customer who want to write to that API. So for the first customer who's trying to spin up, the, you know, whether it's OpenShift uh, containers or it's VMware, NSX, or ESX, he doesn't have to know about the API at all. He simply just manages things in vCenter and he just keeps going. Right. right? So the API is basically the engine underneath that drives uh, you know, everything. He just goes about his business as he always does. As he always the API, does. His, his big switch is presenting well, it's connectivity to him and he doesn't care about the magic behind that. It's actually better than as he always does. It's actually different in a way is that he no longer has to pick up the phone and call a networking guy saying, hey, I need a VLAN at this port. All he has to do is say, spin up whatever it is in his, uh, in his resources he mm -hmm. wants from compute. And that will automatically, through VMware or Nutanix, send an API call to us, and we will automatically configure the port it's connected to. And because vCenter is going to tell us all the characteristics about that VM, that mm -hmm. compute, and it will automatically configure that port wherever we see that virtual device. And just like any cloud, I, I, I should be able to have the capability from a network team perspective to create policies yes. and guardrails about what the VI admin can do. Exactly, yeah. Uh, very much of the, all the background of uh, like the Google Andromeda project, they were actually part of the, the team that helped build out. So left and right, it's the same teams and the same technologies underneath. And so you get all that benefit you just mentioned there in the same way that Google does. And so the panel session we have done in the past with several other major financials, insurance companies, transportation, uh, car manufacturers, it, it's no longer about being Google, it's actually enterprise to get that same benefit you're asking for. Now, on the flip side of that, that same API that vCenter is doing is the same one that your own developers or yourself can write to to get any information or send any configuration. So if you want to write your own GUI, you are free to do that. Right? That's what a true open approach does. Now, the other thing that's really interesting about this is the open hardware part of this, Big Switch has no switches in our portfolio. None. We maintain software that runs on open networking switches. So, for example, in Don's environment, he buys Dell switches because they're open network capable. And he runs the switches the same way that people run their servers. Right? You have a server that can run multiple operating systems. The switches now can run multiple operating systems, multiple switch operating systems. And so when he deploys his environment, he's running our open source based open networking Linux, the same one that you see deployed in a lot of those cloud providers on the left, right? And then our controller manages that open source NOS to keep it running and moving you know, seamlessly. So it is truly the same way that a cloud provider will do it. Now, on the last side, and then uh, I'll hand off here to Don. This allows you to do some pretty interesting as we consider these pillars of designing a new data center. And that is, is that you have, we call all these approaches in doing this view at cloud first networking. That is that you're not going to take a campus solution. You're going to actually start with a clean slate to build a true cloud platform. If you want to build a new data center for the new future, you should be taking the same design patterns that all the other you know, cloud providers do. So that gives you the ability to actually design and build and operate your entire on-prem network using the same tools and approaches that all the cloud providers do with none of the actual complexities because we've actually got it so easy to use that you can deploy it very easy. Like I said, an intern did it in the morning. Right? And there's many, many stories about customers being able to move very, very quickly to do that, which creates a completely different experience on-prem. That means you can provide exactly the same experience for all the application and VMN teams that they were going to Amazon for and self-service. And that's one of the really critical things about you know, what is really behind cloud, as one of another customer pointed out to us, is that cloud isn't a place, it's idea of self-service and immediately being able to deploy based on whatever the application needs. The network becomes invisible, automatically adapts to whatever the application wants, which then creates that third column, a completely consistent experience, not only for the application developers, for the VM and develop group, but also the networking team. Because now the networking team knows exactly what the experience is going to be like, whether they're in the on-prem data center, the colo, or 
in a public cloud. They can mirror all the same VPCs they have deployed up in those clouds on-prem, making it very easy for them to troubleshoot and help solve problems. Now, one thing that comes out of this, as before I end here, the way we approach SDN in this is that we're actually exposing the network to the VM teams, and the VM teams now are able to see not only the network, but the network teams are able to see the VMs, allowing them to collaborate a hell of a lot better than they ever have in the past. So whenever you look at our GUI, for example, you'll see a network topology, exactly the way it's laid out, and you'll also see the VM topology and how it's connected to that in our GUI. When you're in the VM GUI, you can also see the same thing because we have plugins that to show exactly where every VM is plugged into what leaf, what top of rack in that environment. So as Don will tell you a story about his environment, it's a pretty interesting way of helping making operations so much, much, much more seamless. Right. So we're all typically not networking guys in this room, yeah. but you might have uh, said a curse word. Yeah. GUI. Yeah. API. Yeah. <laughs> I'm a traditional uh, CLI guy. When I hear those terms, I get frightened away, and I instantly say, "Yeah, no thanks, but no thanks." I'm a, I'm I'm a command line guy. Yeah. So many people are, and more and more people coming into our industry now aren't. And so that's one of the interesting things about that is because that was why I was trying to point out in the beginning is that the API is the center of this. The name Big Switch as a company name is actually born out of actual architecture. So whether or not you have four or you have 40 switches deployed in one of our you know, pods, the whole thing is managed as a virtual chassis. So when you actually open up a CLI into a Big Switch, named after the Big Switch networks, the whole GUI is managing all of those leaves like their line cards in a chassis. The spines are just the actual forwarding paradigm inside the same chassis, right? The cards. So that allows you to actually get a much easier experience if you're coming from a traditional networking environment into actually a big switch. Far easier than even some of those other solutions some of those vendors are providing. Now, because the CLI is there and it's API driven, that means the same CLI you have, you can use easily. Newer members that you don't want to give CLI access to, or maybe they don't like CLI because maybe they're a generation or two younger, they can go in through the GUI. It's exactly the same interface and same management. Because remember the CLI, you actually, there's a command there that says show rest. When you type that in, every command you type will actually pop up the actual rest command it's sending to the controller for each CLI command. And so to script, to know what you want to do, the test, maybe you want to script something from a DevOps perspective, Type in the commands, it'll show you the actual REST commands right there, and you can actually use that, copy and paste it right into your, your script. It's that easy. Yeah, so I, I think it's out of the scope of this presentation, but I really like, I'm really interested in understanding kind of how state is managed across this distributed system because oh, yeah. this, that is a major problem. We, that's a nirvana that I'd like to have tried to get to 10 years or so ago, so that, that would be a really interesting yeah. Um, coming Side from conversation. both a uh, service provider and military background myself, you know, the idea of 30 seconds down is not acceptable in a right. lot of environments we're deployed in. All right? So everything has to be hitless in our perspective. So there's a lot, of, a lot of work we do in trying managing state between the controllers to make sure that you don't go down in that perspective. Yeah. In fact, in our own environment, we, we created this thing uh, called, well, actually, we created a test environment that runs our campus. So the same thing from our CEO all the way down to our QA guy to marketing to myself. We all sit in the same campus network. It's actually running on one of these networks. Our whole campus runs on a big switch, right? And so as support's taking phone calls, as the CEO is you know, doing meetings, we're all running on this environment. But what's also running in the background is something called Chaos Monkey. Have you guys ever heard of Chaos Monkey? Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 Yep. So Chaos Monkey, we have a custom environment of that. So before we ever ship, it's going through destroying links, destroying boxes, shutting down controllers nonstop before we'll allow it to release. And this is on our live production environment where we're actually doing our testing, writing code, and taking phone calls. Right? So we live and eat exactly what we talk about. 